As you all know, this is the third Sunday of Advent today, and this morning we lit the candle of joy. Joy and peace are two themes that we encounter throughout the season of Advent as we uh, approach Christmas. We, we see these themes of joy and peace on cards, on holiday decorations. We hear it in the music that is streaming forth from malls and churches and even on the radio. And yet experience shows us or teaches us that joy and peace are sometimes really elusive. They are really hard to find especially at this time of year. Loneliness, family tensions, uh, inflated expectations, unexpected crises, grief, national or international events. It makes it seem like joy and peace are, are just beyond our grasp. Our world produces anxiety. At every corner, there is some new fear to haunt our dreams and burden our days. And making the situation worse, it seems like advertisers and newscasts do their very best to keep our anxiety levels up here at Code Orange so that we will buy the latest gadget, we will ask our doctor about the latest wonder drug, or we will begin that new workout or new diet fad. This elusiveness, this hard to find joy and peace, it invites us to pause and reflect on what it is exactly we are seeking. What are we looking for when we speak of joy and peace? Is it an emotional high, a state of perpetual happiness, an absence of conflict? Or do joy and peace represent the hopes that have become little more than a seasonal habit? Oh, it's Christmas, joy and peace, Merry Christmas. And is there a difference between joy and happiness? Or do they mean the same thing? Are they simply different words describing the same thing? Henry Nouwen, a Dutch Catholic priest, professor, writer, and theologian, he describes a difference between joy and happiness. He says, while happiness is dependent on external conditions, joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, or even death, can take that love away. Joy can be present even in the midst of sadness. And I experience this so often when I am meeting with families as we are working together, planning a funeral for their loved one. And as we tell stories, as I listen to their stories about their loved one and their times together, there's often laughter. And yet they're laughing while tears are streaming down their faces. There can be joy in the midst of grief and sadness. Paul's words today, they offer sweet, sweet relief to both the ancient world like the church in Philippi and to us, the modern readers of the word. Our reading this morning from Philippians chapter four, it offers us a helpful framework for exploring joy and peace in relation to our life of faith. When we consider this passage as a whole, it suggests that the substance of joy and peace is not found so much in the emotions that they evoke, but more in the attitudes and behaviors and relationships in which they are grounded. Think about it. Think back to my example of sitting with a, fa a grieving family in the midst of that sadness, there is laughter despite the tears. And that laughter, that joy, is rooted in the relationship that they had with the person that they are grieving. It's a complicated relationship to be sure, but it is rooted there. And it's like that with God. It is rooted in our relationship with God and our relationship to the body of Christ. Finding joy, for example, in a period of waiting is not easy. 
as we are waiting for a loved one to come home, as we are waiting for a diagnosis, as we are waiting for COVID to be over. And for Paul who wrote this letter, the waiting is occurring in a prison cell and the outcome for him does not look promising. It looks like he's either going to die in that cell or perhaps be executed for treason. For the Philippians who are receiving this letter, the waiting occurs as they long for news of their beloved church leader of Paul in prison, their pastor and friend, their partner in mission. They have even been waiting for Epaphroditus, one of their own, who had traveled to Rome to be with Paul, to care for him during his imprisonment. And they have been eager to hear news hoping beyond hope for a good outcome. And as Paul writes, he says that for himself, joy is not a feeling that is dependent upon his circumstances. For Paul, joy is a theological act. It is a God act. It is choosing to reflect on God's actions to redeem the cosmos, to redeem the whole world. Even when the present circumstances, his personal circumstances, might indicate that some other power had won. Joy stems from Paul's vision of God's exaltation of Christ after his humiliation with death on a cross. Joy stems from the vision that all of the world will recognize the sovereignty of Jesus when he returns. The Lord is near, Paul reminds us in verse five. Whatever they are suffering now, whatever the grief they are feeling now, as they long for his safety, whatever fear they have for their own futures, Paul reminds them that the real king is near. Have no anxiety, be worried about nothing, Paul says from his prison cell. The naysayers will come, the believer's faith will be tested. They may suffer as Paul has suffered, but Paul urges them to think like Jesus, who stood in solidarity with the oppressed, taking on the form of a slave. Yes, Jesus died on a cross. Yes, the powers that be killed him, but a far greater power exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. This is the God whom they serve, and this is the God whom we serve. This is the reason that they can rejoice. And it's the same reason we can rejoice too. God did not abandon Jesus and God will not abandon them or us. The Lord is near. The Lord is so near that they can speak to God and take all of their concerns to this all-powerful King. And then alongside this call to rejoice is an offering of peace in verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What I wouldn't give for a taste of this peace. In all honesty, I don't, sometimes don't even really know what it would feel like. This peace that transcends understanding, guarding both my heart and my mind, in my own spiritual journey, I have had glimpses of that kind of peace, fleeting glances that tease me of the hope of something more. Oh, to abide in such peace. The peace of God will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It is a peace that is not about simple calmness or the absence of anxiety. This peace is better than understanding. A more literal translation of the Greek word hyperecho in verse seven, which is translated as peace, a better translation of that instead of peace would be have power over. In other words, peace has power over. It excels, it surpasses understanding, reckoning. It is superior to human understanding because peace comes from God. It stems from the work of God's spirit to bring about God's new creation. Peace, after all, is God's shalom, 
a wholeness, a restoration, a goodness. And the presence of this peace can give joy in even the most difficult of times. This is why Paul can urge the community in Philippi to be peaceable to all. Let all people know your gentleness. Because how we believe in hard times reveals a lot about our vision of the good news. If we have to work to bring our own justice, we're doomed, just like the Philippians. Epaphroditus nearly died looking after Paul. And the future does not look very bright for Paul either. They are in a system and a situation that seems hopeless, but Paul places the believer's hope back in God, whose power is greater than any in the world. And so in this season of Advent, in a time of waiting and longing, we read this call, this exhortation to rejoice. Rejoicing does not negate or turn a blind eye to despair. Rejoicing does not somehow make the suffering go away or minimize the injustice that perhaps we feel. Instead, rejoicing acknowledges that we are serving the one and only God who can rectify the wrongs and who can and has and will stand in solidarity with the oppressed. Rejoicing in the face of gross injustice is a courageous act, a theological hope lived out in the present that stems from a vision of God's shalom. I think here, I think here about the civil rights movement and them marching and singing hymns even as they knew they were going to be beaten and sprayed with water cannon and have dogs attack them. It is a shalom so glorious that it is transforming and claiming of life in the present moment. It was their, those civil rights marchers, their steadfastness in the face of oppression that transformed the civil rights movement and brought more people to their cause. Our passage from Isaiah this morning it also reinforces this message of joy and peace as well. I don't know if you know or not, but not all of the Psalms in the Bible are found in the book of Psalms. And not all the good news in the Bible is located in the Gospels. A Psalm is defined as a sacred song or hymn. And today's Psalm is a song of good news that is located in the scroll of Isaiah. Now, the prophet's task, the prophet Isaiah's task was to preach a word so clear that it was to sound a certain note on the trumpet of life so that faith could be reborn in the hearts of people whose faith had died, whose faith had been squashed because of the exile that they were in. Isaiah's task was to preach a word that could raise the dead, a familiar task in this secularizing world. In this psalm, Isaiah's strategy for creating faith in the exiles was to call them to praise God. It was that simple. Well, not simple, but it was clear. Because ask yourself this, is it easier to say to a person who is struggling with their faith, oh, you just have to believe? Or is it easier to say to them, Let's pray. Is it more effective to scold someone saying, trust in God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength? Or is it more effective to say, let's sing this hymn together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Or in this season of Christmas, joy to the world. What Isaiah does here in the psalm in Isaiah 12 was essentially this latter option. I'm not going to scold you. I'm not going to command you. Let's sing together. Let's sing praises to God. 
And so in the midst of exile, with all of its emotional and physical and spiritual trauma, the prophet invites the exiles to sing their familiar songs of praise to God. The prophet goes back to their history and draws up old language and old vocabulary of Israel's experience during the Exodus and promises that with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. There's that line right in the middle of the passage this morning from Isaiah 12. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And this promise, it gets even better when we understand that the word translated here as wells is more accurately interpreted as fountains. Now fountains are moving water. A fountain is literally a gift where water gushes forth. Whereas with wells, humans have to dig them. I like the distinction between the two because the waters of salvation are a gift right? They gush forth from God. All we have to do is accept them, trust in them, drink from them. And the moving water in our Christmas story is the waters of childbirth. Water flowed from Mary, and from this fountain, this childbirth fountain, came Jesus. Ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes, two ears, and one nose, a heart that loves, lungs that breathe, hands that healed, and legs that walked in and out of people's lives. And we had this vulnerable human package of salvation that was wrapped in the flowing waters of childbirth. Incarnation came from the waters of childbirth. The fountain flowed and we received, the world received this gift of joy. And so on this Advent Sunday of joy, as we draw closer to Christmas Eve, what does it mean for us to draw this tiny vulnerable baby from the fountain of childbirth? What is this salvation that we hold in our arms when we treasure the Christ child? And by drawing this salvation from the fountain, how do we see ourselves being in alliance, being a team with God? God has chosen to be incarnated with us as humans, to align himself with humanity. Have we aligned ourselves with God? Will we be able to sing joy to the world this Christmas Eve with passion and meaning? I pray it may be so. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.